name's Clint McElroy. Welcome to our Bible study. Today we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 9. This morning we will have assembly at 10 a.m., so please join us if you can. We assemble just before 9 a.m. to present the Bible study on the large screen at the auditorium if you want to join us there. You may recall the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus from the Acts study we had previously. And it is that burning in the heart that they had while they were in the presence of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is something we're looking to kindle in our own hearts through a continuous study of God's Word. In Leviticus chapter 19, we're told to be holy for God is holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy, is the phrase. And to do that, we need to know what holiness is. We need to know how to measure our behavior against what God expects a holy people to do. So we go to the scriptures to study it, to compare what we find there with the behaviors that God expected people to engage in with our own lives. And that's how we can determine if the things that we're doing today are in alignment with the holiness that, that God expects his people to be engaged in. My name is Clint McElroy and I am a sinner. I am someone who needs a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. If I stand justified on the day of judgment, it is not because of anything that I do. It's because I have chosen to believe that the blood of Jesus Christ saves me, that was given up in sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, and the hope that I have in his resurrection is what I look forward to. It is that hope, it is that salvation that I hope you will find a desire for yourself through a study of God's Word, and I hope you will find encouragement toward that in the things that we do in our studies together. This week's study will be a lot uh, less tedious than last week's. Last week we were in First Chronicles chapters 1 through 9. We very quickly went over that material because it had a lot of genealogical information in it. It's very difficult to read. Uh, but there are some points in it that are worthy of note and that I wanted to bring out before we continued our study in Samuel. We have these Bibles from the World Bible School. They're English Standard Version Bibles. They're available through our congregation. If you want to have one, contact our church office at the number shown below. We'll be glad to try to get you one. 1 Samuel chapter 9 from the English Standard Version. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, son of Ephiah, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. He had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward he was taller than any of the people. Verse 3. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you, and arise, go, and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalem, but they, they, they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but they did not find them. Verse 5, When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant, who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again, Here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Verse 9, parenthetically, Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. End of the parenthetical statement. Verse 10, And Saul said to his servant, Well said, come let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Verse 11, As they went up the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water, and said to them, Is the seer here? They answered, He is. Behold, he is just ahead of you. Hurry, he has come just now to the city. 
because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Verse 15. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go, and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys, they were lost three days ago. Do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribes of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Verse 22, Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about thirty persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, See, what was kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed, that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. Verse 25. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. Verse 27. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us, and when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Okay, so previously in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7, we saw the end of the story about the Ark of the Covenant being returned to Israel from the Philistines. And then we saw the beginning of Samuel's judgment over Israel as he judged Israel for several years and brought the people in line with God's will. In verse 15 of chapter 7, it says, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah. And he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there. And there also he judged Israel. And he built an altar there, and built there an altar to the Lord. He spent his life there in Ramah, uh, worshiping God and judging the people of Israel. When he grew old in chapter 8, it says that his sons did not walk in his ways but turned after gain so they were perverting God's will as judges uh, and took bribes and perverted justice it says in verse 3 of chapter 8 and the people of Israel gathered and brought their petition to Samuel that a that, uh, king be set before them and Samuel brought this to the Lord and the Lord said don't consider this a rejection of you. Consider this a rejection of me. And so he offers to let the people have their king. Samuel warns against the consequences of that choice, but the people chose to have a king anyway. So that brings us to the beginning of chapter 9. Last week we looked at uh, 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9. And there we saw among the genealogies, the genealogies of the family of Kish, 
who was Saul's father. And for some reason, those don't really line up in the first verse of chapter 9 of 1 Samuel with what we find in chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 1 Chronicles. I have no explanation for that. I've not seen a comment on it. Kish is Saul's father, and that much is consistent, but the rest of the genealogies have different names, slightly different names, names with spellings that can, could be considered quite different. I won't get into that at this point, but it is interesting to me that the names are not consistent there. It says in verse 2 that one of the sons of Kish was Saul, a handsome young man, and it goes on to say that there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome, that he stood head and shoulders above the rest of the people of Israel, as the King James would refer to that, or New King James. Then it tells this story about the donkeys of Kish. Uh, Kish had lost several donkeys and sent Saul and his servant out to find the donkeys. And it tells this story about how Saul went through various lands round about his father's home looking for these donkeys and not finding them anywhere they went. And it gives very specific names for specific places. The land of the Ephraim where the mountainous places around uh, what we know a lot of, uh, a lot of the story of the Bible that we're familiar with happened in the lands that were given to the Ephraim, Ephraimites. I'm not so sure about this land of Salashah or the land of Shaalim, uh, where these were. And then also it talks about the lands of the Benjaminites. Now, a footnote about the Benjaminites because it's brought up later. The Benjaminites as a tribe were the least of the people because their tribe had been all but wiped out because of some stuff that happened in, as recorded in the book of Judges. And it was only allowed to persist through intervention by the rest of the tribes of Israel. They made provision to make sure that the tribe of Benjamin did not completely disappear. So when we see the comments about the Benjaminites, that's what that is, that is in reference to. It said in verse 5, when they came to the land of Zuth, Saul has uh, lost his will to go on. Uh, and I don't say that in a negative way. He was concerned about his father's well-being uh, mindset. At this point, they'd been gone so many days, he was concerned his father would be now more concerned about their absence than the absence of the donkeys. And he expresses this concern with his servant, and they have this discussion and his servant brings up this point about uh, the man of God or this prophet of God being nearby that they could go see. Saul counters that they don't have a gift to bring to the prophet. Uh, apparently it was expected that if you went to a prophet that you would pay for those services that were rendered. They, not, they didn't have anything that they had prepared to bring on their journey left so that's another reason why I suppose Saul was ready to go back but his servant said wait you know I've got these these silver pieces we can use and and Saul accepts that as an offering saying well said that that was a, a kind thing for the servant to do there's a, a parenthetical note here that I find interesting in verse 9 about the way uh, the language is used here and I'm not sure it's translated in exactly the way that the comment would indicate, but it makes a point saying that prophets were from, were formerly called seers, and that's interesting that their language would change enough in the time between the writing and the time of the events that it was necessary to bring this up, or that their quotes would have been so specific as to include the older language rather than the the current language for the same phrase but apparently that was the case so again we find that language plays a key factor in the things that are recorded in the scripture itself they go on into the city and as they come into the city they find young women going out to draw water and they engage the young women which 
we find out in the New Testament was an unusual thing for men to speak to the women of a, of a strange city in this way, and yet they didn't mention it here as being a strange occurrence. Uh, they just record the conversation. The women respond with, you know, a lot of detail about the nature of the expectation that Saul and his servant would find this uh, seer as soon as they entered the city. And perhaps it was because they were drawing water for this feast of the sacrifice that there was a sense of urgency on their behalf to get these men on their way. Uh, and so they went on into the city, and as they entered the city, sure enough, Samuel is, is coming out on his way to the high place. Then in verse 15, we get a flashback uh, to the day before when Samuel is has this revelation by God that Saul will come to him this next day. And it gives very specific information about him and what God's expectation is of Samuel that this man should be anointed prince of my people Israel. And then it gives details about what God expects will happen with this man, that Saul will save the people from the Philistines. Then there's an unusual phrase in, in verse, in, at least in the English Standard Version, in verse 17, uh, here is the man of whom I spoke to you, and this is back in the current time, it is he who will restrain my people. That's an interesting word, restrain, in reference to what Saul will do, especially in light of the previous statement that he would have come to deliver the people from the Philistines. Restrain is a different word than deliver. It has almost the exact opposite meaning. So is this, uh, is this a comment by God revealing to Samuel the nature of the kingship of Saul over the people, I don't know. It certainly was their experience that Samuel, um, that uh, it certainly was their experience that Saul would bring hardships of of the uh, kingdom on the people that they had not known previously. And perhaps that is what is meant here. It says that Saul approached Samuel in the gate and asked about the home of the seer, and Samuel responded that he was the seer and immediately invited uh, Samuel uh, invited Saul Samuel immediately invited Saul up to the high place to eat with him there now this is the way a real prophet of God works a prophet of God knows before you approach him that you're coming so this is the nature of a prophet of God now Prophecy is not something I've encountered in my life. I've not found anyone who prophesied to me anything and about the way my life would go, except casually by accident. They didn't do it in this way. So there is a you know expectation and kind of a joke about people who claim to be able to see the future. If they could see the future, why didn't they know you were coming? Or why don't they already know your name when you get there? Stuff like that. Well, Samuel didn't know Saul's name, but he knew Samuel, Samuel knew Saul was coming, so uh, that is an interesting thing. And he had prepared for Saul's arrival, and not just uh, in the occurrence of their meeting and the invitation up to the high place, but it, before this had even begun, apparently he told the cook to set aside a portion for Saul to eat when he arrived. But before we get to that point, which is recorded here in, in, a, in a moment, there is this other uh, conveyance between uh, Samuel and Saul about the nature of Saul's business here. Saul had come looking for donkeys, and Samuel gave him the assurance that the donkeys had been found, but that he would answer other questions that were on his mind. And then he asked this particular question, for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Which is a strange question to ask any man about the land in which he lives. So walk up to a strange man and say, is not everything that all the blessings of America to be your blessing? Is it not your benefit? Uh, that's a very strange thing 
to have asked of you. Because it certainly, up to this point, was not the case. Every man enjoyed the benefits of his own labor, but now uh, he would, as the leader of Israel, direct the wealth and, and resources of all of Israel, not just his own house. So this was kind of a foreshadowing of what was about to happen in uh, Saul's mind that would have been a foreshadow. I don't know exactly how to describe it from Samuel's perspective. Uh, his response was, in back in reference to what I mentioned about the Benjaminites, uh, least of the tribes of Israel, what are you talking about? I, and of those tribes, my clan is the least, even though his father was apparently a wealthy man. Why have you spoken to me in this way? And then Samuel doesn't apparently answer him. He takes him on into the hall and sets him down and, and has this food brought out that he, he apparently had set aside previously, which is kind of, a, an, again, a, a, a hint of a proof that this is a true prophet who is telling you something that you need to listen to. It says uh, that Saul ate with Samuel that day, and as they came down, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down there. Apparently, he and his servant were accommodated. Uh, and then at dawn, Samuel called up to Saul and, get, and woke him and told him that he needed to send him on his way. And as he was sent on his way, he asked him to send the servant on his way before and then come back and let me tell you what the Word of God is. And we will stop there for today and go on into chapter 10 next week. Some strange things going on here. The nature of a prophet is very unusual and worthy of some consideration, especially in light of modern day prophets, quote unquote, who would have you believe that they have special revelation from God that you need to hear. This is uh, not consistent with what we find in scripture. Uh, this notion that you will find some special revelation from someone that is in some way different from what you can find in Scripture is completely false. It is not supported from what the Scriptures say. If you find someone, including me, telling you something that is not consistent with what the Word says, don't believe them. Don't believe me. The Word of God is right. It's true. It is not to be denied. And it's even an angel comes to you and says that you're to believe something other than what's here. Don't believe that. That's scriptural. That's in the scripture. You can look that up. No one, including an angel, should bring you a, a word from God that is inconsistent with his word as revealed. So don't believe that. Don't be drawn away into a lie. It's very important that we not be drawn away into lies. Compare what we hear and listen to everything that you can hear, but compare it with what God's Word says and remain true to God's Word. I hope you found something useful in today's study, and I hope you'll join me again next week. And I hope that you will join us today at 10 a.m. if you can for worship services. Have a blessed week.